and I looked through the scope, but all I could see was hair. He crapped his pants, and blood was just <laughs> flowing down his face. I mean, the van was sinking as I was there in the van. So here I was, covered in sand, buried up to my neck. This is a dangerous situation. They kill people for this. All of a sudden, I thought to myself, what if that bear's not dead? I got my knife out, and I just started running down the hill. We're gonna ride this deer down the side of the mountain. Oh, there's nothing like boar hunting. Oh. Facial wounds bleed unbelievable. And all of a sudden, he reached in, and he got me, and he scarred me right down the side of my arm. And I thought, honestly, I thought, I'm dead. Uh, and and I've, got a, I've got a live bear, uh, you know, a foot and a half away. So let me explain to you what's going on. Yes. Okay, you know the game Red Dead Redemption. Two. I've watched you play it. Watch me play it a lot. And I'm waiting for my um, new game player to come. <laughs> the Xbox, yeah. So I'm here to interview my dad today. You play it on Xbox. I play it in a lot in real life. You do. So, yeah, this is what's going on here. So you, okay, let me back up here. So you've seen me play the game a lot. Oh yeah. And when he comes out to Colorado, he watches me play the game all the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so with this new update that came out for the game, there's this character named Gus McMillan. And Gus McMillan is a big game hunter, much like yourself. Yes. So in honor of this update, the naturalist role, mm -hmm. and Gus McMillan coming into the game, uh, it seemed fitting for you to tell your stories. And we had requests about it as well. Um, I've lived the adventure. He has lived the adventure. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, some people were, were asking on the comments because uh, they saw this room here and you can't see much of it, but I'll put something in the beginning of the video so you can see more of it. But some people were asking if he has these horns and all these trophies up, uh, he should tell some of his stories. And I thought, well, that's actually a pretty good idea and he's game so luckily he's here to uh to do it yeah every animal that i have in the room you know what it does is a reminder of a story yeah Be rather than going hunting uh, it's just another story to collect and for me that's what it's all about absolutely that's the thing that never goes away the trophies the animals they can slip all, all kinds of things can happen but a story will never go away and that's what i love indeed so you got a lot of stories about different things you got a dog over here laying on a grizzly bear rug uh, caribou up over here, lots of fish, moose, um, we got black bear, beaver. Where do you want to start? What story? I don't know. Well, let's start with the story of, um, oh, I don't know. Let's start with the story of an elk hunt okay. uh, that took place. So I know all these stories, of course. Uh, we went on a fishing trip, my dad and I, uh, but also with a bunch of friends, and he was telling these stories. Uh, when we were on this trip a couple weeks ago, a week and a half, two weeks ago. Kept everybody entertained. Definitely. So this is all the more reason for other, for other people to hear these stories. So go ahead. Let's, let's hear the story on the elk and uh, let's uh, inspire these people to go out and hunt elk in Red Dead Online. Well, let me tell you, every, every adventure that I've taken with hunting, I've always tried to have it in a place or in a situation that makes it unique and different. Because anybody can go hunt something in a, you know, hunt a moose or something else. But I like to go to some place where it's absolutely just in, you know, un unbelievable place to go. And I love it because then it has a greater story for it. Because I like adventure. I like to really feel like I'm in a real hunt where I'm also trying to survive while I do this whole process. So one of those was we tried to say that we'd like to go for an elk hunt. And uh, my father and I decided to do that and uh, try to find a good place to go for a great elk hunt. Well, naturally it comes to mind Colorado of all places because I mean, Colorado has the biggest and the best for elk and I thought that's exactly where I wanna go. So I made contact with so a guy. What year is this by the way? This would have been in about 1989. Okay. Uh, when we did this particular elk hunt. Okay. Uh, this was the very first elk hunt that we'd ever taken. And so we really wanted to go to a place that was really a unique place to go. Mm -hmm. So we contacted an outfitter in Alameda, Colorado. And this particular outfitter was unique because he actually takes you hunting, not just in a normal plane where everyone hunts, but to the very top of the timber line in the tallest of the mountains, just by the great sand dunes called the Monte Cristo uh, Mountains, you know, El Blanco was the place that we would go to, where I'm telling you, you were so high 
that you got to a place where you would say to you, climb up the side of this hill and you'd start out and an hour later, you're about four more feet up on top of the mountain hill. I mean, it was just unbelievable. And so he keeps his horses at this altitude of about nine, 10,000 feet and brings them down. Otherwise, the horses won't be able to work up there. So but these are these are acclimated horses to Absolutely. That, to the only challenge altitude. was I'm not acclimated. And the people that come up to go hunt aren't acclimated to that kind of height. Okay. But we get through it in a week. And by that time, the hunt's over with. So it was one of those great adventures. So one of the things they did for us was to come down, pick us up, and then take us back to the very top of the mountain. And when we got there, I had all these visions of a some type of a tent camp or something put together. And what it was, was the old fashioned elk hunt camps. That's what the old wood stove in the middle of it all, you know, the horses would be right outside of the tent and they'd be hobbled. So all night long, they'd be hobbling on the ground right by your head. And you thought to yourself, whoa, what an adventure. Are these like the canvas wall tents? That's right, right. exactly. Okay. I mean, it fit the bill. When you saw those, you knew you were on a real 100% elk hunt. And they carried the scars of past elk hunts. Mm. I mean, they were stitched up and they were set and prime, ready to go. Smoke rings where the pipe went through the top of the canvas area itself and probably caught on fire at some particular point. But nonetheless, this is the area we were going to hunt. So he said to us, where we're going to go, this is the side of a mountain right above Timberline. And so he said, we're going to take you out. And I said, well, great. What do we do? And he goes, you wake up at two o'clock and by three o'clock we're on horseback. I said, and that in the afternoon? He goes, no, that's in the morning. I thought, are you serious? I thought, how in the world can, I can't see at three in the morning. How are my horses going to see when I take those up? He said, don't worry about it. Horses know how to get to the path. We took off that next morning, got up bright and early, had a big breakfast, the whole thing, loaded up the pack horses, loaded up the horses that we were riding on and away we went. Now, I'm telling you, it was pitch black. And I kept thinking to myself, my horse cannot see. So I took out my flashlight and held it in front of my horse's head so my horse could actually see where we were going. I thought, my horse is going to fall. And when I turned the lamp and looked down, it was several thousand feet, just immediate drop off. We were yeah. on a narrow path of no more than maybe a foot, a foot and a half wide. We were crawling up the side of this mountain. And I thought, oh man, what in the world am I going to do? Do you think you might have been inhibiting the vision of the horse with the light? Or do you think it helped? Oh, I think I was blinding the horse with the light. And I think he was just nice <laughs> yeah. enough to say, you won't need that light. You can put that away. Right. And of course, the horse acclimated much better at that particular point. Yeah. We get to the top of the mountain where we're going to be. And all of a sudden, the guy says to me, hey, I got a deal for you. I said, what's that? He goes, I want you to get off here and I want you to climb up to the top of that mountain up there at the top. But he said, you got to be real quiet because, you know, elk can hear. And on one side of the area was clear rock rubble, boulders. And on the other side was a dark, deep forest. He said, this is a perfect area for the elk to move back and forth. And when they move out, that's when you can shoot. And I said, great. So he said, get out here and just climb up to that little uh, peak right up there at the top. Well, I thought, no problem. This is probably going to take me, what, 10, 15 minutes to go up there? I tell you, I took two steps and all of a sudden, I'm completely out of breath. At the same time, and that rock rubble, every time I take a step, I'd go down a foot for every foot that I advanced. So I was just like one of these repeating actions. Finally get to the top of the hill. I'm telling you, I was like, whoa. I was feeling lightheaded. I was breathing hard, you know, trying to get my breath. And I soon discovered the reason I was having a hard time getting breath, there's no oxygen up there. That's why, AKA no trees. But I thought, nonetheless, we've got it made. So I get to the top of the mountain and all of a sudden I look out and I'm trying to see where these elk are. And I noticed across the way, that there was the deer that were settling in across these uh, rubble areas. And I thought, you know what? I need to take a deer. That's what I need to do. I had a license for a deer and an elk. And I thought, I'll take one of those. Mule deer? deer. Mule deer. And I looked across the way and there was this monster mule deer. Oh man, beautiful widespread, the whole thing walking over there with all those does. And I thought to myself, I can shoot this one. So I pull the gun up and I get ready to shoot this thing. And I have to tell you, while I'm up there, I'm trying to breathe at the same time. So the breath's going like this. The gun is moving up and down. I thought, I got to calm down a little bit. I just got to take my shot where I am. So I looked over to the side of the hill. I pulled the gun up and I shot and down went the deer. And I thought, yay. A few moments later, the guide comes and he says to me, he goes, did you just shoot a deer? He goes, yeah. He goes, you didn't want an elk. I said, yeah, I want an elk. He said, well, you know, you shoot that elk, you shoot that deer. And he said, all of a sudden, those elk aren't going to come around for a while. So we need to go over there, collect that deer, and then come back. So we trudged over, went up through the snow banks that were there, got to the top of the area where the trees were. And I said to him, oh, man, how are we going to get this deer down? 
Every time I would step, I'd step maybe two, three foot in these, in these deep snow holes. And he goes, here. And he pulled one leg back and the other leg back, took the horns and he held on to them. And he said, hop on. I said, hop on. He goes, yeah. He said, grab a hold of the legs. Now, if you got to imagine this, this deer is laying there with the head, the guy holding the head. I'm holding the two of the deer's front legs pulled up. And all of a sudden he says to me, hop on. Hop on? Where are we going? He said, we're going to ride this deer down the side of the mountain. I said, what? He said, it's all snow. We'll use it like a toboggan. And I said, why don't we just pull it? He said, we'll never make it. He said, you'll wear yourself out. The snow's too deep. Hop on. And I'll never forget as I watched him as he used that deer to move us down the mountain and adjusted the legs in order to make sure we avoided the trees as we got down to the bottom of the hill itself. So you rode it down like a sled? We rode it down like a toboggan sled. <laughs> now, I'm, I know that deer aren't made for that, and I've never seen anybody do it, but that's what the guide said to me. And I said, you know what, man? If that's what you want to do, we can do it. We can go down that hill. We could make it to the very bottom. So that, that was the piece. All right, so you got your deer. Got the deer. I'm feeling real good. The next day, I thought, I'm going, for, I'm going for elk today. So I went back, let us off, up at 2 in the morning, on the road by 3, get up, walk up so it's in the pitch black. He said, now you've got to stay hidden because the, deer have, the elk have great sight and they'll be able to see you from a great distance. Well, I set up on that mountain and all of a sudden the sun came up and it was getting hotter and I thought to myself, man, it's great. But what I need to do is go to the bathroom. And I thought, how in the world can I go to the bathroom up here on the top of the hill? But I'd been smart. I brought a roll of toilet paper with me. What better thing could you do? So all of a sudden, I prepared myself for a, a respite. And as I did, all of a sudden, I kicked the roll of toilet paper. Now, I want you to imagine a 150-foot roll of toilet paper <laughs> rolling down the side of a mountain and flying in the wind. I mean, just everything, that, I mean, something that an elk would never have seen flying like a thing, pointing at me, like a little arrow, saying, here I am, right here. And I thought, oh man, so I'm trying to pull that toilet paper in as the wind's blowing it around. I finally get it all the way in. I thought, oh, this is not going to work. I'm never going to get myself an elk. So I was sitting there. The day came to an end. Nothing happened. I thought, man, I got to crawl out of here. So I said, you know what? Tomorrow, I really want to go for a great event. She said, I've got a great thing for you. He said, there's a high mountain meadow and he said, this meadow is a perfect place for you. He said, in fact, that a lot of the elk come in, but they come in late in the day, almost towards evening. But he said, I'll take you there tomorrow. And then I said, I want to put you in that place. I want you to stay there through most of the day. And then I want to wait and see what you can come up with. So I remember the next day, got the same thing, brought it out, left my flashlight down, didn't want to put it in the horse's eyes, get up to the top of the hill. And all of a sudden he gets me into this meadow and he says, now come walking in. So I walked in with a little pack. I had a flashlight my roll of gray furnace tape, you know, the duct tape type stuff, went over, sat in the brush and looked out over this. I looked at the end of the meadow and there were deer walking around back and forth, but I was waiting for the big um, elk to come. So it got towards evening and then it got darker and darker. And of course, when you're in the mountains, you know, you know that it gets darker in the mountains when the sun goes beyond the mountains much quicker than what you would normally think. I was waiting for that elk to come in and all of a sudden, I thought, well, I heard this noise. I didn't know what in the world the noise was. I thought, what is going on? And I look over to the side, and I hear this thing coming down the rubble, the rock rubble on the side. It was completely dark, and I thought to myself, what in the world is this? And it was making noise. And I thought to myself, is this, this some kind of a, you know, Yeti? I mean, I got the abominable snowman up here, and he's going to walk out into this. Maybe it's an, a well, giant... You don't, you don't have that head either. You don't have a... Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. So, well, not yet. So, anyway, right. I thought to myself, man... This could be some kind of a giant grizzly that's coming out. So what I did was I took my flashlight and I taped it with the duct tape to the top of my rifle. And then I thought, I'm not going to turn the light on until, he, until I hear that he's breaking through uh, into the meadow. And I looked and I heard the noise and it was crashing a brush. And I thought, man, this thing is having a terrible time up there. So I pulled my gun up and I got ready to go and I just aimed it on and I waited. And all of a sudden... I could hear it coming to the edge of the timber and all of a sudden it broke through the timber. When it broke through the timber, this thing came walking out. I mean, it was upright, walking on two feet. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what in the world could this be? And I turned on my flashlight and I was ready to shoot. All right, that'll look great over your fireplace. Oh, I was thinking to myself, I could just imagine how I'm going to taxidermy this thing. And all of a sudden, it turns out to be this guy, this other hunter. And I thought... 
what in the world is this guy doing? He's not even hunting in my area. He's on the other side of the mountain. And so um, I, I went and I yelled at the guy and he finally came over to me. I said, what happened? He goes, oh man, he said, I shot an elk. And he said, I tried to go after it. And he said, I got lost. And he said, so anything I could do is go to the top of the mountain. I got to the top of the mountain and I didn't know where I was. So I decided to come down another hill, which brought me into your valley where you were. And he said, I've been sliding down those rocks. Look at my clothes. Look at me. He said, I'm all cut up. I said, you were sliding down those big boulder fields. He goes, yeah. He said, I was completely lost. I finally got to the bottom of the hill. I fell into all the brush that was at the bottom and the trees. I tried to work my way through the trees. Completely dark. I didn't have a gun. I didn't have a flashlight. I had nothing. It was just me. I left it all back there because I was just going to go find the elk and bring it back over. Oh, man. He's in a terrible time. So anyway, he gets the elk back over. So anyway, I'm sitting there with him. And he's telling me this whole story. So finally, we waited. And I said, well, the guide hasn't come to get me yet, so let's just wait. So about 10, 10, 30 at night, here came the guide. He came in. He goes, you see anything? I said, yeah. He goes, what did you see? I said, right there, this guy. He goes, where did you come from? He said, where's your horse? He said to the guy. The guy goes, I don't have a horse. I don't have a, a gun. I have nothing. He said, because I left it in the other mountainside because all of a sudden I went to go get this elk that I shot. He goes, how the hell did you get to this side of the mountain? And he said, oh, I said, I don't know. He said, I just went up because that's where the light was. And then I got to the top. By that point, the sun went down and I couldn't see myself. And he said, that was when I was in pitch dark until I got to the other side of the mountain. Been, oh, man, what a crazy thing. So it was the third day of the elk hunt. And this time I decided to go back up into that mountain area where I'd been to the peak where the toilet paper and all the other things that had gone on. In the midst of that, then all of a sudden I was watching and out came about, I don't know, maybe... 10, 15 elk came running across the, the path. And I thought, man, if they're all coming, there must be a, a buck, a bull that's coming in a few moments. So I, I waited for that. So as I watched, I began to think to myself, man, it's amazing how these elk have a tendency to look like horses. And I thought, I really had to look a couple of times because it was getting dark. And I thought, man, one of these, I mean, I, you have to really watch. I thought this could be a horde of herd horses rather than an, you know a, a bunch of cow elk and I watch and all of a sudden this bull comes walking out and I thought this is exactly what I want I mean I've got the space in place for this and I thought it's going to take it slow and make this happen and the elk was standing there and all of a sudden I pulled up my gun came walking out and I just pulled the trigger and bang I shot and the elk just kept walking well I knew I'd hit him so I pulled in another shot and I shot again. Now I don't know if the second one hit, but the first one did. And he went walking over and then he was like moving slow and kind of tripping a little bit. And I thought, man, he's gonna fall at any point. But it was dark enough that I couldn't really see as he was in those rubble fields. So about an hour later, here came the guide, probably at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, the guide comes and he says to me, how'd you do? And I said, I shot an elk. He goes, you did? And he goes, yeah. I said, where? And I said, it went right up there. I think it's on the other side of those boulders. He said, well, let me go look and see. He said, I'll tell you what you do. He said, get on the horse. And he said, uh, just give it its head and it'll find its way home for you. I said, what? He goes, just, they know their way home. Just kick the horse on the flanks and just let him go. He'll take you back. Well, that was a little scary thing for me, thinking of those paths and everything else. I left, went back, and I was just waiting for him to come back. He said, don't worry, I'll get the elk. He said, and then I'll put it on the pack horses and I'll bring it to you. It was a long evening as we waited for him to come back. The only challenge was he never came back. I thought, where in the world is this guy? I mean, he's supposed to come back with my elk. Where is he? And he said, uh, you know what? He said, you know, they said he, he, he was here and he's got everything he needs. So, you know, we'll wait and see what happens. Well, we needed. And then early the next morning, here came the guy back to the tent. And I said, oh, did you find the elk? Nope. I go, you didn't? He goes, yeah. No, I want to tell you the story. He said, you know, I went up to where you said that elk was on the other side of that boulder field, he said. And I looked and it was like bedded down, but it stood up and it kept walking. But I could see it was bleeding. So he said, I thought, man, I can take care of this. So I got over the side of a hill, kind of a steep hill, you know, and the elk was there. And he said, so I decided, how in the world can I get this elk? Because I don't have a gun, he said. I thought I have a knife with me, but I have no gun. And he said, the only thing I could think of was, he said, trying to be creative here. He said, I'll just, I'll go up the side of the mountain and I'll get above the elk. And then what he said, 
uh, when an elk comes walking by me, I'm going to run as fast as I can down the side of the mountain, and then I'll I'll hit the elk just like a football player. <laughs> bang! I'll bash into the elk, knock it over. And he said, I took my knife with me because then he said what I was going to do was grab the knife as I knocked the elk over and slit its throat. So he said, then I could have my the elk done. I could bring it back. Now this is in the middle of the night. He's doing this. <laughs> All of a sudden, he gets up there to the hill, and he thinks, oh, God, man, I got this all set and ready to go. So as he gets up there, all of a sudden, I said, so what happened? He said, you know, I got up there, and all of a sudden, I looked down, and there was that elk, and it was standing right there. He said, And he said, as I looked at it, I had a flashlight, little teeny thing, but at least I could see where it was. So he said, okay, so I got my knife out, and I just started running down the hill. I didn't yell or anything. I was just trying to be as quiet as I could, but I was running down that, that mountainside, you know, with not much of light at all, trying to hit this elk sideways. He said, I ran down and all of a sudden I got right up to the elk and all of a sudden, just as I got up, the elk stepped back, stepped back. And he said, I rolled all the way down the mountain. He said, I rolled and rolled and rolled and rolled. I lost my knife. I have no idea where I'm at. He said, I'm just tumbling. He said, you realize the steepness of that mountain and there it is. And I thought, where in the world did that elk go? So he said, just to make sure this is clear, yeah. Your guide was going to tackle the elk and cut its throat. That's right. The elk sidestepped him and he fell off the mountain. Exactly. So I almost had a guide to be a trophy. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. No, he almost I mean, the whole thing. So anyway, so he comes back to the camp and I said, so where's my elk? He goes, it's up on the top of the mountain. He said, because I, I got up there, but I'm going to take a gun. I'm going to go get that elk. He said, now bring it back to you. He said, so you get on the pack horses and go ahead and go back to town. And he said, uh, wait there for me. And he said, I'll bring it to you. And I'll bring it to you later on this afternoon. I said, great. So we went there. We were waiting for him and all of a sudden waited. Went through the entire night. He never came the entire night. I thought, what happened to my guide? And the next day I'm waiting and get up in the morning. I look outside and here is his pickup. And uh, he's parked in it, running. I thought, I went out and I tapped in the window. I said, hey. I said, you get my elk? Oh, yeah. I got your elk. I said, how did that happen? Well, you know, he said, after I rolled down the side of the mountain and had a terrible time, then I got back up and I'm trying to find that. He said, I traced that elk with some of the blood that it was rolling. All of a sudden, he said, I got up to a place and I saw the elk. And he said, it was bedded down. And I thought, oh, it's bedded down. It's all stiff. So all I need to do is go up and I'll just get close to it and I'll just shoot the elk, you know, and be done. So he said, I walked up the elk, and when I got the gun ready to go up, all of a sudden the elk stands up and starts running again. I thought, impossible. This can't be. I said, what did you do? He said, I just kept running after that elk on the side of the mountain until finally, he said, I got to a point where the elk stopped. He said, I pulled the gun up, and I was ready to shoot, and the elk fell over dead. <laughs> fell over dead right there on the side of the mountain. <laughs> he said, all this adventure, I even had the gun ready to go. He said, I was ready to shoot. And instead, he said, the elk falls over dead. So he said, I got the elk, got it all clean for you. And now I got it down here. And so it's no problem. And here you are. And I thought, are you serious? He goes, yeah. And he goes, well, I was coming down. But he said, I want to tell you what happened. I said, what happened? He said, well, I had to put it on the pack horses. He said, we string them up, you know, with about four or five horses in a pack string. We were coming down the hill, had your elk on the back of some of the horses. And he said, but since we're going to break camp soon, I had these 20-gallon these propane tanks hooked on. Well, he said, as we were coming down the mountain, all of a sudden, one of the horses got spooked, hit a tree, knocked the valve off the top of the 20-gallon LP tank. It started hissing. The horse thought it was a snake, took off and ran, and I lost every one of my horses with your meat. <laughs> and they all were running away thinking that somehow there was a giant... A rattlesnake that was trying to get him. He said it took me half a day to get those things into the evening. So finally, I got the horses found, got your meat, and that's how I'm here with your meat. Uh, he sounds like a good guy in some ways, but unlucky. You know? Unlucky, I tell you. This guy was Mr. Adventure, and I think this really taxed him out. I think he finally had met his match you yeah. know, at this particular Never point. got it again. I, you know what? I really wonder if he ever did because I have no idea whether he actually took that on again. Because how much time? That's did, an adventure. So Most guys shoot an elk and they clean it. Everything's sure, ready to go in sure. a couple of hours or something. So how much time passed from when you shot the elk and when he was back in the parking lot? Two days. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> two days. 
Oh, that's so that's good. because he, by foot, he's trailing up and down these mountains <laughs> at about 11,000, I think it's 11,500 feet or 12,000 feet is what this mountain is. Yeah. It's El Blanco. He's traipsing up and down the side of this mountain trying to find this elk so he can claim it and get it back from me. I mean, I, 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 I love the guy. He was a great dude. And uh, it was a fun thing. But I think it was the only time he ever spent two days trying to get an elk that refused to die. It would lay down, it would come back up again. He tried to knock it over. He's the one who fell down the side of the mountain. He finds the elk. All of a sudden, the elk stands up and runs away. Then he goes and gets a gun, comes back, and just when he's ready to shoot the elk, the elk falls over dead. <laughs> two days later. <laughs> two days later. And then he loses his pack animals who are running around with the meat on top of their pack straddles. And That's tough. Anyway. That's tough. I mean, I got a, several of those stories I could tell, but no, that was the, what happened with the, uh, that's what happened with the, uh, the elk story. So it was a good one.